the hour here. Stephen Taylor is a senior lecturer in psychology at the Leeds Beckett University. By the way, he's calling all the way from the UK. Mm. And yes, yes, ladies, he has that British accent. All right. So uh, <laughs> I think he's taken already. So no, sorry, Jennifer. No, no luck there. So best-selling books on psychology and spirituality you know and by the way psychology he, he speaks about psychology and spirituality psychology the original definition of psychology was a study of the soul hmm. and we have just intellectualized it you know thanks to Freud and the gang we just intellectualized it in the the past so many uh decades but it's really was originally for the psychology of the study of the soul so you know and here he is he's he's actually bringing it back i guess he's bringing psycho the old meaning of psychology mm -hmm. back spirituality and psychology Bring, right? bringing psych back Bringing psych back for the last four years he has been included um this year at at 62 in mind body spirit magazine listed of the 100 most spiritual influential living people his book includes waking from sleep the fall out of darkness was a great one the back to sanity which is we're going to be defining sanity today by the way at least from his perspective. And his latest book, uh, The Calm Center, his, his book has been published in 19 languages, while his articles and essays have been published over 40 academic journals, magazines, and his newspapers, including Philosophy Now, uh, The Daily Express, The Journal of Humanistic Psychology, and others. He regularly appears on the media in the UK, um, has recently been featured at the BBC Radio 5, BBC Radio Scotland, my hometown, Scotland, and BBC World TV, BBC World Service Radio. Eckhart Tolle has described his work as an important contribution to the shift in consciousness which is happening on our planet at present. If you want to get in touch with Steve, uh, Steve Taylor, you could go to Stephen M. Taylor, that's T-A-Y-L-O-R, dot com, Stephen M. Taylor, and you could catch him, and, and we're going to be talking about his different courses he has online as well. But welcome, Stephen. Glad to have you here on the Good Intention Show. Hi there, it's great to be on the show. Thanks All right. for inviting me. Uh, absolutely, absolutely. So much to talk about. And really, your latest book is The Leap, uh, and it's the psychology of spiritual awakening. And I tell you, I, I very seldom read read a lot of the books that I've given to read uh, because, because it's not a lot of time, right, uh, when, you're, when you're interviewing people. However, this book just captured me, and I did read it, and it was just fantastic. Well done. It really, and, and your examples in there with the different people you have, uh, kind of bringing home your points and your and your concept was uh, well done too. So, uh, outside of oh, a, outside of established a psychologist, I mean, you are an excellent writer. <laughs> oh, thank you. I so. was actually a writer before I was a psychologist. Oh, really? So. Oh, okay, yeah. okay, all right. So it kind of goes hand in hand, right? Okay, so I'm going to start out with Ooh. a couple of uh, really easy questions for you here. Okay, cool. how how do you define consciousness? And after you de define that, how do you define collective consciousness? <laughs> wow. <laughs> So you, you were being ironic when you yeah. said easy. <laughs> yes, I was. <laughs> I, I want to set the tone of our depthness of our conversation going to be today. So I want to throw you right okay. at you. I know you can handle it. <laughs> well, consciousness, I guess um, there is consciousness in a general sense, and there is consciousness in an individual sense. I think consciousness in a general sense is something which pervades the whole universe. It's a, a fundamental quality of the universe. But in an individual sense, um, that kind of uh, all-pervading universal consciousness becomes manifest in us as individuals. And consciousness is the, the essence of our being. It's the, the fundamental quality of our beings. So it goes uh, beneath thinking, beneath emotions, beneath the body. It goes beneath them all. It's the foundation of them all. It's the, it's the quality we experience when our minds are quiet, when our minds are silent. And even if you're in a dark room with a completely silent mind, you can still experience your, your fundamental essence of consciousness. Fascinating. And I, I appreciate that answer. Uh, and on an individual, let's just focus right now for a minute or so on the individual uh, definition of consciousness, if, if that's even uh, you know, accurate, <laughs> you know, because we're all one, right? Um, so when we, there's like a natural human drive and desire to define our own reality. So when, when we do this and everyone has their own perspective because that's just how we're unique individual souls trying to define our own reality. How does consciousness play? What role does consciousness play in that aspect of, I assume our ego is defining our reality, right? Or is it our consciousness defining, or we're defining consciousness? Mm. How would you describe that? 
Well, I would say that ego is really a tiny aspect of consciousness. If you think of a, a house, um, ego is like the, a tiny attic room in the whole house. Uh, but the problem with ego is it becomes more powerful. It's only a tiny aspect of consciousness, but it's kind of a, it believes it's the most powerful aspect. So it tries to take over our whole consciousness. It tries to make us forget that the whole house is there. So we become kind of trapped in this little attic room. <laughs> And we, for, we forget that the rest of the house is there. Right. And as a result, we, we often feel a sense of uh, kind of claustrophobicness. It feels claustrophobic to be trapped inside the ego. And we feel that there's a lack of space, a lack of air. And we feel a, a sense of separation. The ego creates a sense of separation. Yeah, and it seems to be a, a important aspect. Like you said, it, it, it's 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 like it's like the Frankenstein monster. It seems to take over the take over the uh, all the landscape there and of consciousness. And it seems to be so powerful that I can't I can't just assume that it's it's not supposed to. There has to be some type of learning or growth uh, that parameter of our ego and how it gets, it's so hungry and it wants to eat up and take up space. There has to be some higher purpose or is there a higher purpose for it other than, other than just being our external sensors and and analyze our tool to analyze this three-dimensional world well if you look into um kind of prehistoric human beings yeah uh, I, wrote, I wrote a book called the fall which was kind of a study of uh, prehistoric human beings and a study of the trajectory of human history and how human beings became so um kind of warlike and aggressive and patriarchal and hierarchical mm. Early human beings had a, they seem to have had a very simple kind of consciousness where they didn't experience separation. They experienced a sense of connection to their environment. Uh, they had a sense that nature was sacred. They felt connected to nature. They had a reverence for all living things, for all natural things. And they, they seem to have lived in a state of harmony, a state of well-being uh, with a lack of discord and anxiety. But a bit later on, round about, uh, according to my book, The Four, this is maybe a few thousand years ago, mm. human beings began to develop a sense of separation. They developed a, a strong sense of ego. And the positive side of that, of that was that um, with this new ego, this new sense of individuality, mm. we had more control over the environment. We developed technological skills. We became more intellectually sophisticated and so forth. So in a way that gave birth to modern civilization. Hmm. The ego is really the the origin of modern civilization and all the technological advances of the modern world. So there's really, there's a negative side and a positive side of the ego. Yeah, you know, and it's interesting because a lot of people are think, or they have this belief often is, well, we got I gotta get rid of my ego. I, I you know, gotta get rid of my ego. I don't need my, my ego's causing all my, all this trouble. But it's really more so, isn't it, is you wanna put it in balance because we need their ego. I mean, how would we, how do we navigate here in this three-dimensional world without our external sensors, without our ego? I think if we were just complete aware of our consciousness with no ego, we, of course, we wouldn't be in this, this density right here, would we? <laughs> we need it. I mean, it, but it needs yeah. to be balanced, right? Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. You're right. Yeah, many uh, spiritual teachers believe that the ego should be killed or destroyed, <laughs> that it's our enemy. But I think if you destroy your ego, you become psychotic. You know, if you have no sense of self at all, no organizational structure yeah. within your consciousness, then you can't function in the world. Right. You need, you need some kind of administrative sensor which the ego should ideally be yeah. but, it, but the problem is that the ego takes over it becomes a tyrant it becomes a dictator right. when really it should be just a, a simple administrative center which controls our functions and enables us to survive in the world you know and uh we're going to get into that too of course the defining sanity and you're, I, you're right on i believe what you're saying and it's pretty intri intriguing too because uh, how our ego has been kind of you know misrepresented or a lot of spiritual teachers out there and I think you even discuss this how you have to be careful and, and being a spiritual teacher these days it could be you, know, you could go down the wrong road pretty quickly uh, if you're not I guess in, in grounded on that level too and even I guess balance with your ego but let me ask you a question though you talk about not only in the book but just in general how there's this kind of state of um, there's a feeling right now of something's just not right. There's, there's something's wrong in this normal state of being that we're experiencing right now. Uh, can you just, can you describe a little bit more, like what you're referring to, like what are the indicators out there in this three-dimensional world that that you picked up on that you think there's this collective 
uh, state of being that's that people are just feeling like little I don't know antsy or something's just something's happening, you know. And that, you know, how do you define that? Yeah, well, in my book uh, Back to Sanity, I call it humania. It's a sense of um... <laughs> love it, humania. <laughs> yeah, humania. It's um, it's a kind of normal human insanity that's so normal that we don't even realize it's there. It's part of most people's everyday experience, and humania. It, it, it kind of incorporates a sense of discord, a sense, as you say, a sense of unease, that something's not quite right, a sense of slight anxiety, a kind of background anxiety, which is always there, which people try to escape from uh, by distracting themselves through TV or pleasure or, um, you know, spending lots of time on the Internet yeah. or by, by drinking or taking yeah. drugs. But it's always there in the background, this uh, dissatisfaction, this unease. And I think part of it is a sense of separation because right. the ego, the normal ego is so strong that it feels separate to the world. It feels as though we are in here living within our own mental space. Yeah. As if we're kind of stranded within our own mental space with the rest of the world out there. <laughs> I always thought it was my parents with a problem, but maybe I just mis misdiagnosed it. So um, <laughs> the uh, I, I, I hear you, and I, I think like we had a, a gentleman on Michael Monk. He was talking about his he's kind of his definition of sanity has changed these days, and he's feels like as this level of awareness in our consciousness and consciousness and we're shifting in this spiritual awakening and there's many ways which I'm excited to get into and he's going to share all the different types of ways you could spiritually awaken or at least have what he has observed and uh, you know maybe once ones are I don't know if there's better or worse but we'll get into that but he was saying that sanity is now for him is as he develops and understands that his infinite self his he's much more than just this, this body even our soul is much bigger and and broader of more indicated ind indicated by our consciousness as he grows and learns on an indiv individual basis within himself of how infinite he really truly is that sanity is still being grounded to other people and being able to communicate to other people as you're expanding yourself uh, because he says it's very easy if very easy as you're developing or you're growing and you're tapping into consciousness to lose yourself like you were saying earlier and not to be grounded mm -hmm. uh, how would you define that sanity in that sense yeah i would define it in a very similar way i would say that sanity means transcending the illusion of separateness mm. it means um gaining a sense of connection expanding your identity so that you're no longer just an individual enclosed within your mind space or your body it's realizing that you're part of a whole network of being, which is much bigger than you. Mm. And it's, uh, it's also a sense of transcending unease as well. It's a sense of wholeness within ourselves and a sense of stillness and harmony within ourselves. And it means becoming free of the, the incessant commentary of thought chatter, which mo most of us experience most of the time. Yeah, that seems to get in the way a few a, a few times in people's lives, doesn't Possibly. it? Possibly. Yeah. So, <laughs> so where do you pull your uh, like? I assume you've been a, a, awakened to this this understanding of consciousness and of your own definition of sanity for a while. Were you always like this? Did you kind of come out of the womb with this type of mentality, or did you like lose it for a while and and, and you know did your twenty years of tra twenty years of you know no one know where you were and then showed up at thirty and you're like, <laughs> hey, I figured it out. Like, what was your what was your what was your travel history here? Yeah, well, I can't I can't remember coming out of the womb, so I'm, I'm not sure. <laughs> some people do. But yeah, yeah, I know me. some people do, right? Yeah, at least they say they do. I don't know. But um, uh, well, for me, um, I would say that I was somebody, or I am somebody who was naturally awake. You know, some people become gradually awakened through following spiritual paths. Some people have a sudden moment of transformation, usually in the midst of intense psychological turmoil. But other people like me, they just sort of are innately awakened to some degree. Uh, so when I was uh, 16 or 17 years old, I became aware that, you know, there was a, I, I had these experiences of intense well-being, uh, these moments of intense connection to nature, and the whole world became full of wonder and strangeness. And I felt a sense of awe when I looked at natural scenes. And and uh, later on, I didn't know anything about spirituality at the time, of course. But later on, after a few years, when I began to read books on 
spirituality and mysticism, I realized that I was having awakening experiences and mystical experiences. And that was just natural to me. It was just something which mm -hmm. unfolded for me over, over my teenage years. You know, I wonder if that, just thinking this, uh, I wonder if there's a direct proportionate uh, relationship between people who read a lot and aw who awaken more on a natural level versus people who don't read and have to awaken through, as you, as you call it, a kind of post-traumatic post -traumatic, uh, experiences. You think, you think, you know, that could be a nice poster child for reading, you know, hey, you want to... So you want you want to awaken spiritually in a nice easy way, or do you want to uh, you want to like awakening. you want to slap across the face? You know. <laughs> yeah, I mean, a lot of spiritual teachers think that books uh, too much knowledge is uh, kind of dis uh, is a disadvantage because um, once your mind becomes so full of concepts, then uh... it, it kind of blocks your innate spirituality, and you become too intellectualized. You become a kind of a, a brain in your body, and, and you work um, in a university, and then at that point. <laughs> yeah, that's right. That's where you get a job as an academic. <laughs> but um, but I think books can be very useful. For me, they were incredibly useful because after I had these awakening experiences, I didn't understand myself, and I thought there was maybe something wrong with me. You know, I tried to speak about it to other people, and they didn't understand. They thought I was a bit crazy. So I started to think I was a bit crazy. You know, so luckily I didn't see a psychiatrist. He yeah. would have confirmed <laughs> yeah. confirmed that I was crazy and given me some medication. Yeah, he could be in a, but, uh, he'd be wearing a white straight jacket right now, speaking to us from one of the institutions there yeah. in the UK. Yeah, I, prob I probably wouldn't be here now. <laughs> <laughs> no, but um, yeah. So, so books are very important to give me a frame of reference. No, I, but I bet you're right because I, I've learned. I, I I'd have to say if my awakening was probably more of a natural, just reading your book and the different. I was you know because you read your book and you see. I mean, there's multiple ways of awakening, and, you, and at first, your natural tendency is to, okay, you want to identify yourself. Where do I fit in which of these which of these uh, type of awakenings? And I would have to say mine was probably more like yours, your experience. But, but I have to say, reading, I mean, I was an avid reader, uh, especially self-help now. It's like that's what got me into my psychology path was reading and learning about self, uh, you know, being insecure and like, you know, fear, uh, you know, one of the best books, I think the first book I ever read was uh, How to um, How to Stop Worrying and Start Living by Dale Carnegie. Ah. <laughs> but, um, but no, I, I think that's where I identified more so on a natural, but I think reading really maybe does kind of ease the pain, but like you said, you, you could get lost in the intellectual aspect of it and, and, and not pull from that heart chakra because you didn't have a real life experience is more like we're in our head right do you find yourself sometimes yeah. sometimes missing out on that well not really because uh, i feel as though i'm quite well balanced um, okay. but, but working at a university you know um i hope that none of my colleagues watch this video <laughs> <laughs> i don't know denigrate any of my colleagues but you do, there are um quite a few people who are so kind of intellectually orientated that they stop living in their bodies they live in a world of abstraction and everything becomes very complex and they kind of miss out on the the immediate simplicity of life mm. through becoming too intellectual and i guess that's the danger you need to stay integrated into your body and you need to say you need to stay focused on the immediate present experience of life well you pull a lot from the hindu scriptures too and i think that seems uh, not to talk about you know really get in touch with your heart chakra or your heart your heart type of uh, the vibratory uh, energies from there that and that really seems to speak to you the most did you just kind of stumble in that and I, I'm I love Taoism that's one of my favorites uh, I go to and mm -hmm. I I don't follow an organized religion but I kind of pull from all different ones sounds like you do the same thing uh, what, what, yeah. which one speaks to you the loudest well um, going back to when I was uh, a teenager and I didn't understand my own awakening experiences. When I was 21 or 22, I read a book of, about mysticism, and it was an anthology of passages from different spiritual texts, including the, the Tao Te Ching and many Indian texts. Wow. But there was, uh, there was one particular text which really spoke to me. It was the Upanishads, the Indian text, the Upanishads. And when I read these passages, I thought, wow, you know, I really, I can really see this. I can really see my own experience in these descriptions. So I went out and bought the whole edition of the Upanishads. And it really touched me. It still does now. It's still my favorite spiritual book. So I think my my natural wakefulness is most clearly re reflected in uh, the Upanishads, particularly in, in the passages where they describe spirit in the world. You know, the Upanishads is about spirit in all things. Spirit is the 
fundamental or pervading force in the universe, but also spirit in yourself. It's about how the spirit in you is one with the spirit of the universe. Mm. So there's no, there's really no distinction between you and the universe. You know, and that's kind of a concept. And I listen, I'm with you, but you know, to sit there and to, because you, you have to intellectualize to a certain degree just to be able to articulate to somebody else. You know, you can't just say feel me and you understand it. I mean, I wish we could, and hopefully in time we we can have those telepathic moments in the future if we incorporate that into our school system. Yeah. But for right now, we're going to have to intellectualize that type of understanding. But so when somebody says you create your own reality, and I assume these these scriptures were basically saying that same point um how do you do how do you explain that to somebody when you say you 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 co-create or you create your own reality H how do you get that point across to them to really fully understand it because i could say that to you a thousand times and you you know it's not easy just to really fully encompass that because uh, we all like to play victim don't we <laughs> mm, yeah well i think i don't think the world is an illusion i think there is an external reality i don't think we i don't think we wholly create the world with our own minds but to a large extent, you know, the world, you know, at the same time, we are not passive observers of the world. We co-create our own experiences with our intentions, with our thoughts, and our lives become the expression of our own inner beings. You know, so if you're, if you're a person who is full of negativity, if you have lots of negative thought patterns running through your mind, if you feel anxiety within you, then your life will become negative to the same degree. And yeah, you know, if you live within the small space of your own ego, then your life will become the expression of the ego. Maybe you'll gain some success because you're so ambitious. Maybe you'll become wealthy because you're so, you know, driven to become uh, successful in some ways. But ultimately, you'll feel a sense of separation, a sense of anxiety, just because you're living within that small space. So your life, our lives do become the expression of our own inner worlds, our own inner beings. Yeah, I always get hung up. I mean, I, I'm with you on that. And I always get hung up on how I could be here individually co-creating my reality. And a lot of people have different philosophies and beliefs of what that actually looks like in our three-dimensional world, but um, or in reality, as you say. Uh, but at the same time, there has to be some writing of the fence of when is we're part of the we are one with the collective with collective consciousness we create our own individual reality but yet we're still co-creating with other creators and it just seems like boy to, to, trying to define that reality to me seems to be i could spend the rest of my life doing that and i wouldn't ever go have any fun right i'd stay i stay in university and just try to figure that out maybe, maybe some people find that fun <laughs> yeah, yeah well actually i kind of do find it fun at least the <laughs> chatter about it but um you're not any and we're gonna take a quick break here in a, in, a, in a minute here but any any last thoughts on collective consciousness and and how you create your own reality you want to share yeah um which just to say that um you know we feel sometimes that we are separate but we are never separate you know we're always interconnected with other human beings so when we feel empathy or compassion that's really an expression of our connection between between ourselves and all other human beings so the again the the sense of separateness is an illusion. Mm, yeah, yeah, and you have to remember that sense of separation is an illusion. And you know, I'm I'm glad for that because just think if we knew all the answers, right? It wouldn't be so fun down here in this three dimensional world. I mean, I, I'm glad I have to kind of figure things out. It makes it like like Columbo. I enjoy the uh, I enjoy the, uh, the the game, as they say. All right, we're gonna take a, a quick break here, uh, Steve, and then when we get back, uh, we're gonna discuss the different ways of spiritually awakening. And of course, this is Stephen Taylor. He's the author of The Leap: The Psychology of Spiritual Awakening. Must read. Pick it up. We'll be right back with Stephen Taylor. All right, we're back with Stephen Taylor, and we're discussing. Uh, spiritual awakening as well and of course his book the leap the psychology of spiritual awakening again if you want to go catch him go to Stephen M Taylor.com on his website great website videos uh, <coughs> tells you about his lectures and his courses which we'll talk about here shortly but uh, Steve we were talking about spiritual awakenings and if you don't mind just kind of going through the list of the ones you mentioned in the book but and if you don't mind end on the post-traumatic transformation one because that's what I want to spend a little time on okay okay um, well, when a person undergoes spiritual awakening, um, it's really a shift into a more expansive state of being. So in terms of perception, the world around them becomes more intensely alive. Things become more beautiful, more real. They have a quality of isness and you know, it, becomes, it becomes enjoyable just to live in the world because the world is such a fascinating place. 
And also, um, there's a sense of presentness. We begin to turn away from the future and the past and give our attention wholly to the present moment. We realize that the present is the only thing which exists. You know, the future and the past are illusions. They just exist in our heads. But also, um, there's a feeling of connectedness. There's a feeling that we're no longer separate individuals. We are part of something much bigger than ourselves. We feel connected to other human beings. We feel connected to nature, to other living beings. We feel connected to the whole universe in some way that maybe we can't explain. But also, um, another important thing is that in the way we live, spiritual awakening changes the way we live. It usually means that people are no longer so self-seeking. They're no longer so materialistic, no longer so interested in status or power. They become much more altruistic instead. The mission of their lives becomes one of um, attempting to contribute. You know, there's, there's a shift away from accumulation to contribution. So the main focus becomes, you know, what can we give to the world? How can we help our fellow human beings? How can we contribute to the human race? And just, yeah, so I'd say those are the main aspects of uh, spiritual awakening. Yeah, and uh, it's interesting you mentioned service and uh, altruism because you mentioned also that it's kind of, it's, 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 those two factors, maybe you could speak to how how the magic of those two factors kind of puts your ego in balance because uh, it seems like when people do, I don't know if the right word is graduate to that or they at least they, they truly experience that from an authentic self, that seems to a, a great way of uh, if you're worried about your ego taking over here to put it in place. But sh yeah, share share some thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, service is a great spiritual practice, you know, because uh, when you practice service, you, on the one hand, you connect with the human beings, you transcend your separateness in that way. But the act of giving, it, it transcends self-centeredness, self and it, it makes you realize that you are not the center of the universe. You know, the ego, the whole thing about the ego is it wants you to be the whole center of the universe, to be the epicenter of creation. The whole universe revolves around you, around the center of your ego. But when you act altruistically, then you realize that that's not true. You're not the center. You know, you're part of this great ocean of living beings. And every human being is just as valuable as you. So it's a great way of transcending the importance and the, the centeredness of the ego. In a nice, in a nice natural, non-traumatic way, too. Exactly. <laughs> but uh, let, me, yeah. let me ask you a, a question in reference to the... Uh, the there's the, one of the toughest toughest things you mentioned, of course, in your book, uh, and guys, pick it up the leap, is post traumatic transformation, and and you <clears> mentioned <throat> you mentioned it's rare, but it often is most common uh, of the permanent shifts in a spiritual awakening when people have a traumatic experience, and uh, like give some examples of what what that is, and and why is that more of a permanent? Why do you believe it's more of a permanent change in your life? Well, um, when I researched um, cases of spiritual awakening, I quickly found that uh, and many people reported sudden and dramatic transformations, usually in the midst of intense stress or intense turmoil. So it's almost as if uh, the, turmoil, the turmoil in their lives due to bereavement or maybe a diagnosis with cancer, uh, maybe depression, maybe just a whole series of failures or losses in their life, it seemed to break down their ego and suddenly there was a space inside them for a new self to emerge and become their normal identity. So I met a lot of people who were, you know, were diagnosed with cancer. Uh, one lady called Irene, she was diagnosed with cancer, uh, with breast cancer, told that she only had one year left to live. Um, but immediately, as soon as she came out of the, the medical office where she was diagnosed, uh, she experienced a shift in awareness. You know, the world became a different place. The world became incredibly real. And she felt incredibly grateful. It was the first time that she'd been, well, been really aware of death. Mm. She'd really been aware of the, the reality of death. So it brought about a shift in her perspective. And, you know, for the weeks and months afterwards, she remained in this heightened state of awareness where everything seemed incredibly beautiful. And she felt incredibly grateful. She felt this sense of connection. And she felt this mission to help other people. Unfortunately, her cancer went into rem into remission, uh, but this heightened awareness stayed with her and remained her normal state. And I, I met a few people who were alcoholics and they'd lost everything due to their alcoholism. 
you know, slowly their lives had fallen to pieces, the pieces they, they'd lost their jobs, their families, their self-respect, their friends, everything. And often, you know, at the moment of rock bottom, when they felt they couldn't go any lower, when they felt that they were, they were, they were about to die, and something shifted inside them, something new, a new identity seemed to emerge inside them, like a, a butterfly emerging from a chrysalis. And yeah, that, that's uh, post-traumatic transma transformation. And that seems to be a common theme between people who have those type of experiences. And, and it seems to where it does shift in a more permanent uh, way because it's more impactful. It's more like it, the neural pathway was just laid out immediately. You know, it wasn't gradually you walk down that road. It was just, bam, here it is, you know, because it's such a traumatic experience that it's right there in the frontal lobe. I mean, you think that's more mm -hmm. of a reason why it's permanent or... It's just more of a spiritual, like, it's just a download. Yeah, well, it's, it's definitely a very intense experience, and it, it usually is brought about by the most intense forms of stress. I mean, right. what could be more intense than being diagnosed with cancer until that you only have a few months left to live? Exactly. Or what, yeah. could be, what could be more intense than losing a loved one? You know, it often happens in the context of bereavement. Right, right. But it often takes very intense stress to break down the normal structures of consciousness, the structures of the ego. Mm. So I think that's the important thing, that the normal structures of the ego are completely broken down by the loss and the failure and the depression. That enables a new self to be born. You know, Eckhart Tolle talks about how, that was his kind of experience, you know, sitting on that mm. bench, right? But uh, so I, I, I see that and I think that's really fascinating how people – it's kind of like a it's a it's a it's a, a it's a rainbow at the end of the uh, at, at the end of the uh, it's a treasure at the end of the rainbow there you know it, it's or it's a you're in darkness just remember this could be transformational this could be some of the best thing mm. that could ever happen to you now you do yeah. you, you do mention though uh, that a lot of people who have this type of post traumatic transformation um, you know this trauma based uh, spiritual awakening often many people or most people never do awaken from it they just get lost in the trauma. Mm. That's right. Yeah, I mean, obviously, every human being goes through intense trauma at some, some point, point in their lives. Right, you know? right. We all suffer from illness, bereavement, depression at some stage. But only a small number of people experience um, this sudden shift, this sudden spiritual awakening. Right. So the question is, why do some people have the spiritual awakening? And why do the majority of people not experience the spiritual exactly. awakening? Exactly. There you go. Why do they, ex they just experience the suffering and the pain? <laughs> But um, yeah, I think that one of the important things I found was that um, an attitude of acceptance was really important. Mm. Then, you know, I think when, when, we, um, when we suffer turmoil and trauma, the natural reaction is like fight or flight is to resist, to fight the trauma, to fight the situation. And, or, or maybe to refuse to acknowledge it. Maybe Den to denial. just to denial, yeah, to distract yourself from it. But I found that the people who experience transformation they first of all they acknowledged their predicament they faced it they didn't deny it and secondly they didn't resist it they accepted it they surrendered to it they let go of any opposition and that moment of acceptance often it was a very you know instantaneous moment of acceptance that was often when the transformation occurred well, you know, that that seems to be, I, I could see that being a very uh, a common theme for the people who did turn a trauma into a spiritual awakening was that one word, acceptance. And I guess when you're in the middle of a trauma, it, it is almost, hard, it's not nearly impossible, but I could assume it could be only, it, it could be very challenging to accept something. And almost like the more traumatic it is, you're forced to accept it, right? And so you could have, yeah, uh, yeah. And, but I, I find it just fascinating how people uh, who are, stay in this state of denial uh, and um, uh, who perpetuate this, this, they're avoiding this learning moment, this in incredible spiritual awakening in that process. And I want to ask you a question in reference to the, the role of uh, positive intentions, that pl how positive intentions play in post-traumatic uh, transformation. I mean, does it lessen in the time or I mean, what, because like, acceptance is a big piece of it, but how, how, do you, how does your state of being because uh, when you're in this negative state of being, it's hard to like be the observer, right? Uh, but how does how does positive intentions play if if it does? Well, um, I think there has to be a sense of trust. You know, in order to accept something, you have to trust that you're you know that this process you're going through will have a, a positive outcome. Mm. I think a lack of acceptance um, implies that you're 
you on the one hand it implies fear a lot of fear mm. and it also implies a lack of trust but i think if you feel connected to something bigger than yourself something transcendent then you always trust that you'll be looked after in some way and you always trust that whatever you're going through is part of a process which will have uh, a positive outcome in the end so i think you know there has to be a sense of trust which allows you to accept a situation yeah yeah because trust first and then accept in second that that makes sense how that would probably go in that order uh because I, mm. I find a lot of people who have those experiences uh trust is kind of an issue uh or at least at least maybe initially but you know you, you got the prodigal son you know they come back and they had their experiences and now they're much more spiritually awakened uh, at that level because they went through trust they went through the acceptance and uh, i just think that think that's really neat so one of the things that we talk about often is how we we have a choice here in this world if if you will that we can learn through pain or we can learn through love or, or basically we're here to experience contrast one way or another we're going to experience contrast the question is are we you know and this is where i think you touch on it with the post-traumatic uh, experience there do you find it either better or worse or do you find it uh i guess better or worse whether you learn through pain or learn through love i mean do you judge it in any way value judge it at all well, I don't think you can um, you can judge it really because I think in some ways um, they're two sides of the same coin. And you can't really posit a duality between them. Um, you know, a lot of incredibly painful experiences give rise to love. Um, a lot of incredibly painful experiences give rise to joy, and that seems to suggest that joy and pain, suffering and love, are in some way closely interconnected. It's a bit like, um, you know, it's, um, I had an experience once years ago when I was in a, a state of intense suffering and intense stress. And I had, I had this sudden feeling that I was ecstatically joyful and incredibly depressed at the same time. And somehow it didn't seem to matter. They were the same thing. It was a bit like a, a gentle wind that could push me in either direction. Mm. So they, they were part of the same landscape. And mm. maybe it was only my perspective of the landscape which could turn it into joy or into pain so why is there then i mean i i hear you and i and i really identify with what you're saying in reference to you could look at pain and, and joy or pain and love from a, a a similar frequency but yet coming from two different perspectives right uh, but why is there such a rightness for human beings not to want to suffer or they're you know you see a child being abused you want to stop you know grab that child away from that parent and and stop the uh suffering right there seems to be a uh, a higher level motivation more so not to suffer than there is to suffer even though you could have even a better spiritual experience i mean what how do you explain that human nature part of it well yeah i mean life is a paradox in a way because um <laughs> isn't it <laughs> life is a paradox that's pretty marvelous <laughs> <laughs> but um so i've lost my train of thought oh yeah yeah sorry i was i was talking I was, I was talking about how the human nature we have like it oh, is yeah, a, yeah. do you think i always i always equate it to like uh steve where love is more powerful than hate or fear but is it is it really on equal grounds is the universe neutral where you could either learn through love or learn through pain is there a, a one better than the other i mean I don't know. I don't, you know, especially, you know, reading stuff like what you put out uh, in your books, it, it really challenges you to rethink that type of concept, mm. right? Well, I would say that love is the essential um, quality of the universe. Love is a, a basic reality. You know, love is part of consciousness. Yeah. In Hinduism, they, they have this wonderful phrase, sat, chit, ananda, which means being is consciousness and bliss. It means that it basically means that bliss is a natural quality of life. Bliss is the natural quality of consciousness. So as long as I'm conscious, uh, I can experience bliss. Mm. And we experience that um, in ourselves, but also in our connections with other human beings. You know, we, we share compassion, we share love, and we share the blissful nature of consciousness itself. But I think what suffering does is even though it involves pain, even though it's extremely difficult to endure, I think it actually opens us up so that we can experience more love. Mm. It opens up the, the channel so that more love can flow through us. Or you could say it, um, it's, it helps us to transcend separateness 
to transcend the ego so that we can experience more love. So I think maybe that's a connection that suffering enables us to experience more love. Mm, yeah, and, and, and love can can help experience more love too. It's like, so it really comes down to a choice if we really claim our power back that we could choose to learn either way in, in contrast. But uh, just, mm. just fascinating. We're going to take another quick break and uh, and when we get back, we'll go to a little more easier questions. We're gonna, let's talk about a little bit about uh, spiritual awakening and sexual awakening. You know, you mentioned that in your book and, and how they really go sometimes hand to hand. We'll be right back with Stephen Taylor, author of The Leap, Psychology of Spiritual Awakening. We'll be right back. All right, we are back with Stephen Taylor. You can reach him at stephenmtaylor.com. Check it out. It's a great website. Go there. And uh, he has uh, online courses. But before I get into the questions here, t talk a little about your courses online and, and what you offer. I think it's just fascinating stuff, and I really strongly recommend our listeners to go check it out at stephenmtaylor.com. So tell us a little about your, your course. I, uh, I teach on academic courses. Um, I teach on an MA, master's degree in transpersonal psychology. Um, and also one of them is an online course, which anybody can join anywhere in the world. It's a master's degree in uh, consciousness, spirituality, and transpersonal psychology. But also um, through my website, I, I, uh, I run five or six week courses based on my books. I think the next one is running in September. That's based on, that'll be based on the leap. Okay. It's called Making the Leap. So we'll be exploring some of the basic ideas of the leap and how we can apply them to our own spiritual developments. Listen, I'm going to save some money. Instead of sending my, my son to college here in the States, I'm going to send him to go live with you. And uh, he, you could, you could he'd send him up on your online courses. You know, he eats a lot of food, but I'll send you some money for that. And then uh, I'll tell you, you know, I, I joke and I jest, but honestly, I really want an alternative education. I can't stand our education system anymore. It's all this indoctrination. We're learning stuff that it's just, it's, it's dumbing us down. We need to have more universities such as what you're doing. I mean, let's turn you into a university. Let's, you know, it just seems to, that's, direct, that's the direction we're going to, going in spiritually. And we need to incorporate this in our day-to-day -day lives. We need to incorporate this understanding of stuff that not only you mentioned in your books but just general understanding of how uh this this the def definite def defining of our reality can assist us and stop worrying about whether you know trigonometry is is the way to go you know or uh, <laughs> or, or the false sense of history we were given right uh anyway i digress but so uh, okay before we get into the uh because the sexual aspect of spiritual awakening let's talk a little bit too about real quick here about the psychedelic awakening uh, you mentioned that in your book about are you referring to more so like dmt ay ayahuasca type of experiences or uh what, what's your what's you know i'm or timothy leary back in the uh 70s and the lsd that type of experience right yeah. old timothy leary but what do you refer to in, in your book on that that's what I'm referring to. I'm referring to LSD, ayahuasca, DMT. Um, and I'm a bit skeptical about using psychedelics regularly as a kind of a, as a tool of awakening. But just at con just, just like concerts, sorry. that's all. Just at like concerts, right? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or, or, or festivals. <laughs> um, Woodstock. And like <laughs> Go ahead. But, um, um, but I think for a lot of people, um, a single psychedelic experience can be a very important event in their lives. It can be a sudden realization that there is a wider reality and a sudden realization that the world that they took as normal is only a limited part of the world. And it can, you know, it can be a sudden awakening to, you know, to a small degree. It can be a sudden sense of empowerment, which leads you to investigate other spiritual practices. So often uh, psychedelics give people a glimpse of a, a transcendent reality, which encourages them to follow spiritual paths and practices in order to reach that reality in a more state, sustainable and stable way. So psychedelics can be very important, but I think the danger if you take them too regularly is they, they can disrupt the normal structures of awareness with nothing to replace them so that you become, you, you know, there's, there's a danger of becoming um, mentally unstable, I think from regular ingestion, ingestion of psychedelics. Sure, and then, and then at that point, like everything else, like sugar or alcohol, it becomes a distraction from your spiritual awakening more so than a, uh, you know, a, a catalyst to it, right? Yeah, it's a question of uh, moderation. Everything is a question of moderation. Right, that's true. Um, <laughs> but, um, but yeah, psychedelics, they, ha they have had quite an important impact on many people. You know, you mentioned Timothy Leary, but a, a better example is Ram Das. You know, uh, Ram Das, he was originally Richard Albert, a psychologist who worked with Timothy Leary, 
But his experience of psychedelics led him to investigate Indian spirituality. And ultimately, he became a, a spiritual teacher. Mm. So that's the positive side of psychedelics. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Okay, so how do you, and I know the Hindu scriptures is a Karma Sutra that, that talks about, oh, yeah. it's Karma Sutra, right? The, spiritu the spiritual awakening and sexual awakening. I mean, how do they go hand in hand? I mean, how, how, do, you just, how, do, you, how do you walk that fence there carefully? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, for a lot of people, sexual experiences can be temporary awakening experiences so while you're having sex or after sex it can give you a glimpse of a transcendent reality it can give you a sense of connection not just to your partner but to something transcendent something sacred something bigger than yourself something mystical and spiritual so for a lot of a lot of people have temporary spiritual experiences during or after sex so that's quite important and of course, as you mentioned, in many Indian traditions, they practice celibacy um, in order to, you know, we have the sort of the, the Western tradition of celibacy, which isn't quite the same. <laughs> yeah. But in, in wait, India, ten, ten, um, wait 10 minutes before next time. Mm -hmm. what, what is this? What is the Western <laughs> definition? <you know? laughs> That's right. It's like, uh, like Mick Jagger said, everything in moderation, apart from sex. <laughs> I remember that one. I forget. Um, but, uh, <laughs> but, um, but in India, there's a recognition that sexuality is an energy yeah. and you can transform the energy into spiritual energy. Mm. So a lot of Indian practices, a lot of yoga asanas and a lot of spiritual, um, other spiritual practices are based on transmuting sexual energy into spiritual energy. So that's really the, the main element of celibacy in the Indian tradition. But um, in our tradition, you know, uh, in Western cultures, um, you know, often we we become too sexually centered. You know, we live in a culture which um, um, kind of um, celebrates sex. There's nothing wrong with that, of course, but we we sometimes objectify sex and become a bit too um, a bit too orientated around it. Yeah. But I think sexual energy is incredibly powerful, and if you allow it to harmonize with your spiritual energy, it can have a, a massive transformational effect. You know, I, listen, and I, if there's one lesson to learn out there, yes. I mean, we seem to go from extreme to extreme to like very stuffiness and don't mention sex to, geez, anything goes, right? But like you're saying, there's a moderation. But I think a lot of a lot of people, and I, hopefully it's changing and shifting for the better, are regrouping and realizing that sexual energy, sexual um, orgasmic experiences really in line with your spiritual awakening or in line with your your spiritual self can be so much more enjoyable especially with that one person that you could uh, you could bond with on that spiritual awakening uh, journey it, it mm. just, it's 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 probably a poster child for monogamous sex really <laughs> because right now it seems that we're just gone in just the opposite direction we're just you know we're chasing this dragon just chasing a uh, orgasm for whatever reason but we're losing the mm. whole purpose of meaning or we're, we're not we're, we could be getting so much more out of it if we truly unite with that other person on that mm. level right yeah yeah in, in tantra um sex is supposed to be a union of the two forces of the universe the passive and active forces of the universe mm. shiva and shakti so sex is a, a sacred act of the union of the universe and yeah i think you know if we can take if we can take the attitude and imagine that not imagine but experience the union of the universe symbolically through the sexual act and really give ourselves to the to the oneness that we experience the unity with another person and that unity can expand beyond that one person beyond our individual selves mm. and it can become an experience of the unity of all things of the whole universe wow you know what a great what a great conversation topic of course we're running out of time but um uh, just when we're just getting heated up here right <laughs> <laughs> but uh one last question for you uh steve uh, what what's next for you now i mean i started of putting out books anything that you want to experience here in this 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 three-dimensional world this time around at this point or you just want to sit back enjoy your time with your kids and uh you know and take psychedelic drugs i don't know what, what, what's next for you um, well, I thought about becoming involved in politics. The world's political situation is in such a mess at the moment that <laughs> I think uh, I should. Be you are you and... are on drugs, man. If you want to get involved in politics, <laughs> no, I'm only joking. I'm only joking. Somebody, somebody needs to sort it out. Yeah, you know. Listen, trust me. It is. Um, you know, but I, I think I think 
it, what uh, what I how I view it, and maybe uh, we we be willing to come back on another conversation because another show and another conversation because I think that really some real life solutions. I love staying grounded in the three dimensional world here mm-hmm. in reality. At the same time, I love incorporating our spiritual beliefs into because I think that's our that's our future. That's the real new world, that brave new world we're creating. Um, yeah. But uh, yeah, but I definitely want you to come back if you're willing, and uh, and we'll talk further about that, and maybe come up with some answers. You know, maybe we'll have uh, Stephen yeah. Stephen Taylor running for uh, what for parliament or you know maybe have them have them gerrymander out here and run for the presidency or something you know <laughs> yeah who knows uh, that, yeah that'd be great <laughs> all right all right um again guys you want to uh you want to catch uh steve taylor uh you could you catch him on his website it's steve m taylor.com also pick up his book will be on our uh also our reading our, our recommended reading to the leap uh, the psychology of spiritual waking excellent book i read it guys you will not be disappointed i promise and he has so many other books out there too as well Hey Steve, hold on one minute too. Once we once we close the show out, if you don't mind, I have a question for you off air. But um, guys, enjoyed. Uh, we have uh, thank you, Steve, uh, for coming on and, and sharing this information. It was wonderful. I really appreciate it. And we'll we'll yeah. have you back and we'll talk. You're welcome. We'll talk politics. <laughs> All right, guys. <laughs> listen, have a uh, what is today? Friday, Thursday, Wednesday, Wednesday. Jeez, we got two more days there. All right. Well, uh, I'm going on. I'm going on holiday, as they say in the UK. I'm going on holiday tomorrow, so I'll be back on Monday. And uh, we will uh, catch you guys later. Enjoy the shows. And uh, we have some good shows popping up that we'll put on rebroadcast tomorrow and the next day. Thank you, guys. Take care.